Doyle. Uh, Jane has been part of South Australia's media landscape for over 30 years. She's an accomplished print journalist before moving to radio and television. Jane has presented seven news for over 30 years. She's passionate about arts and community and chairs Car Clues, South Australia's peak youth arts body. She's also a patron of the Mental Illness Fellowship of South Australia, Ambassador for Impact 100, patron of the Flinders Medical Centre Foundation and a cabaret festival advocate, which is only just finished, or yes, cabaret is just finished. Now, I've known Jane for a few years now. Jane is a supporter of the Salvos and annually emcees our uh, Red Shield Appeal uh, launch. And uh, Jane has a wonderful ability to uh, make a person feel comfortable and at ease uh, when she interviews them. And I've, and I've watched Jane interview some of our clients from the Salvation Army who are very nervous about standing up in front of people and she just makes them feel at home and draws that story out. I know Paul is a little bit nervous today, um, but Jane will make you feel at ease very soon and draw that story out that you want to share uh, with, the, with, with the meeting today. So she's made herself graciously uh, avail uh, available to us today and like last year, Jane will interview Paul, our new president, and we're going to look forward to hearing Paul's story as Jane chats to him. So please welcome Jane Doyle and of course our president, Paul Denver. Well, thank you very much. Oh, it's on. That's good. It's always good when the microphone works. It's helpful. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Mark, for that very generous introduction. Um, it's always sobering, isn't it, when you hear your sort of potted story, and I was sitting there thinking, gosh, that's more than half my life at Channel 7. <laughs> it's probably time I looked for another job. Anyway... It's my very great pleasure to be with you again today. I remember last year's event, we were on the other side of the wall, on the other half of the room for Heidi's um, introduction to you all as your new president. And this year, Paul joins me with the microphone. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Jane. Now, we'll start at the very beginning because it's a very good place to start. Good and I know you've got your family here today, which is marvellous. They take up an entire table, which Absolutely, is wonderful. Yes. And what's most impressive is that your mum's here. Yes. And she forms a large part of your story because your mum and dad brought you here yep. from somewhere else. Where did you come from? Okay. So I've got a number of slides to show you. And the first one is the Isle of Man. So the Isle of Man is a little island in between England and Ireland. It's about 36 miles long, 10 miles wide, so convert that to kilometres. Um, and we emigrated to Australia in 1966. But before that, I've got a couple of other things to show you. That's the flag from the Isle of Man. So why the three legs? Why the three legs? Mum, can you pronounce the Latin? Hang on. I didn't, she didn't know she was doing this. I just made it up. It's all right. Hi, I Joy. Quo quonque jacarus dabbit. Quo quonque? Jacarus. Jacarus. Stabbit. Stabbits, which means? Whichever way you throw me, I stand. Okay, that's why it's got three legs. Thank you very much. And the spurs? Why the, why the spurs? Any particular reason? No, <laughs> none that I know of, no. Maybe we're a bit prickly. <laughs> or maybe it was back in the day when everybody wore spurs. Yes, with their boots, I think. Yes. Probably. Even women back then wore their spurs. I haven't got mine on today. Had I known, I would have popped them on. Ah, and the motorbikes. Now, so, I do know about this. So the fact that the Isle of Man is very small, it, it's actually famous for quite a number of things. Um, probably the biggest thing is the TT races. Now, we had uh, Royce Rowe speaking to us a while ago, and he races over there. The track has been around for over 100 years, 
Um, it lost its Grand Prix status a number of years ago because of safety regulations. So when you look at the photos, you'll see bikes off the ground, lumps on the road. They ride on a, a regular road, so they're often bouncing off the road. They're going past very old, solid brick walls, stone walls. That's over Balaf Bridge, where they actually take off. Again, the brick walls. And if the riders on regular motorbikes aren't mad enough, the people that ride sidecars are even worse. People who ride motorbikes generally yes. are crazy, but having a nephew who rode in superbikes oh, for a okay. time, yep. uh, none of those roads would... No. You couldn't do superbikes on them now because no. there's no safety spaces for people to Nothing. go off. So what sort of bikes ride there now? Superbikes. The bikes that go around there are as fast as the Formula One bikes. They're crazy. They're absolutely mad. How and many people die each year? Every year somebody dies. Of course. And... Uh, I remember asking somebody why they have hay bales in, some, in front of some of those stone walls and I thought that was for cushioning, you know, if you hit the mm. wall and they said no, it's to soak up the blood. So every year there is a death. It's just madness. That is crazy. Oh, I thought you were going to say it was to protect the walls. Uh, well, it might be that as well. <laughs> now, here are people that we like to call our own but, of course, the Bee Gees were well, English, didn't come to South Australia for a while. No, actually, actually Manx. So they're born Sorry? on the Isle of Man. Yeah, so if I you're thought. born on the Isle of Man, you are not English. You are Manx. Just as Scottish people are Scottish and Irish are Irish, okay. the Isle of Man is its own country. So we're Manx. M-A-N-X? X. Like the cat? Absolutely. Is and that where the cat comes from? You're going to see a cat in a minute. Oh, excellent. <laughs> so the Bee Gees are famous from the Isle of Man. Um, I used to tell the story that I actually went to one of the houses of the Bee Gees once after it had been sold and I got to sit on the toilet that Barbara Streisand had sat on. But Mum tells me I got that a little bit wrong. So my, Auntie Dot had been over there, hadn't she, to visit them. And, she, and that was the story, okay. I'm sure Barbara Streisand says the same thing, yeah. that she sat on a toilet that Paul Denver yeah, sat on. That's right, very famous. Um, Nigel Mansell, famous Formula One driver. He's based on the Isle of Man. I drove against him. No, I didn't. I drove in the same Grand Prix <laughs> ah, that he did. Fantastic. And here are the Max Cats. Which are tailless. That's it. So uh, I don't know the story of how they lost their tails. There's lots of postcards with all sorts of images. But uh, our mum knows. Oh, here we go Back again. to Joy. <laughs> if I'd known I was doing this, I wouldn't have gone to the gym this morning, Joy. Well, I was always led to believe that um, they were the last animal that went on the Noah's Ark. Oh, and the tailgate shut on them. Yes, they were just got in just in the nick of time, but they lost their tails. I like the story. I like the story. We'll take that one. Oh, That's a long way up. Yep. There are stairs. There are <laughs> stairs, but I chose not to use them. So, the Isle of Man... Clearly, Mum is very dedicated to it, yes. and your dear dad, who's yep. just had to go into care, yep. can't be with us today, but we're going to have to... Mark's over there, and he keeps a very strong timeline, so we're going to have to fast forward through this, or yep. we'll never get through it all. Okay. Um, you immigrated. You were a little boy, and you yes. came here in 1966. Yes. So, uh, born in, the, in Douglas on the Isle of Man, that's the town. Mum and Dad, on their wedding day... Gorgeous frock. Look at that yep. waist. Tiny wee thing, Joy. And then when a mummy Aww. and a daddy love each other very much... Little babies happen. Little babies happen. So that was me. <laughs> Mum insisted on uh, me wearing long socks, which, and I had sandals on, which apparently nowadays you're not allowed to have long socks and sandals. And there's our family. So we emigrated in 1966. Um, we arrived in Perth. We'd been on the Fair Star for quite a while and came to Adelaide but went straight through to Melbourne because uh, Mum and Dad heard that there was work over there. Dad was a plumber. So Dad got involved with the gas conversion where um, everybody was moving from bottled gas to natural gas and all of the home appliances that used gas had to have uh, different fittings put on them. So he did that for quite a while. 
At the same time, Mum worked as a uh, jewellery buyer in uh, Walton's, one of the big stores, and also a couple of other jewellery stores that we'll touch on in just a moment. So, that's a big shift. I should be talking to Joy. That was a big <laughs> shift to bring a family, the three of you, to, to Australia. What do you think drove that? So, Mum and Dad came out when Mum was 28. So, she's only just a little bit older than Erin, our eldest daughter now. And I work with a lot of people who are new immigrants to Australia and I'm always fascinated by the story. To be that young and to decide to go to the other side of the world where you know nobody on the hope that it's going to be sunshine and, and wonderful but and what a was the life. driver? So the driver, I think, was opportunity, wasn't it? An adventure. Yep, a sense of adventure. So I dropped everything and came to Australia. But, as we'll find out as we go on, it was a venture out into an adventure, but the pull back to the Isle of Man was strong because we went backwards and forwards a few times. Correct. So, we so that's an interesting uh, situation for lots of emigrants who find themselves, or the emigres, who find themselves torn between the home country and their new country. And, Joy, you've been here now for forever... Yeah but you still feel that the Isle of Man is home? Or do you? That's what your son said. You've got two homes. Yep. And wherever you, they throw you, you land Stand. standing up. That's right. So what do you remember as a little boy? What's your first image of uh, Australia? Um, I remember the, the ship. Um, we went through the Suez Canal one time. We went through the Panama Canal another time. We've been backwards and forwards quite a few times. Um, so I certainly remember Melbourne and starting school there. Um, I've just got the slide up there of my brother and sister and mum and dad. There's three of us in the family and uh, I'm the eldest and then it's five years down to my brother John who came to a meeting recently and then it's another uh, eight years down to my sister, so 13 years with my sister. So that's brother John, that's Rachel, myself and Jonathan. He is John Denver. Um, he doesn't sing, he's not rich. He doesn't fly experimental planes, and he's still alive. But, uh, yeah, he is John Denver. And then, obviously, there's Mum, who came to a meeting just recently. So, so what's, early, your, what's, earliest your first, memories. what's your first memory of Australia? What was your first impression? Um, I just remember playing with all the kids in the street, and days lasted forever, and it was sunshine, and you could ride up and down the street, play football, do whatever. It was just safe. Um, and I go back now and look at the house we lived in, and it was tiny. Yeah. But at the time, you thought it was a castle. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So you did your education largely in Melbourne, then you had a trip back to the Isle of Man. I'm just scooting yep, you yep. through this a bit because yep. we're going to run out of time, uh, I can tell are, you. We are. <laughs> so, uh, yes, started uh, primary school in the Isle of Man, uh, sorry, in Melbourne, went back to the Isle of Man, ended up going through, I think, eight schools or nine schools in 12 years. Um, Mum and Dad uh, worked incredibly hard and decided that the way for them to get ahead was to renovate houses. And so it's often a family um, uh, competition when we get together with the siblings to work out who's lived in the most houses. And uh, I think I'm in 20-something, but uh, my brother and sister are in more. So, But that was the way Mum and Dad got ahead and, and was able, were able to provide for us. And we lived in magnificent places. So you ended up back here for high school, having yep. started high school on the Isle of Man. You came back, back. bright and high, yep. and that's where music came into your life for yes. the first time? I, I started playing guitar at nine when I was in the Isle of Man, and then when I came back here, I went to bright and high by accident, because that's just where mum happened to buy a house, and got involved in the music program there. Got through to uh, year 11, and mum and dad decided we're going back to the Isle of Man. So they sent me off ahead in September because that's when the new school year starts over there and I was living with my grandparents. Because I knew I was going back, I didn't work too hard at some of my studies in Australia. And I actually got two Ds for Maths 1 and Maths 2. I oh, know, sorry, Jeff. And uh, I went up to the teacher afterwards, Mr Trembath, I still remember his name, and I said, Mr Trembath, look... I'm leaving, you're never going to see me again. Is there anything we can do about these two Ds? And he said, okay, okay. And he changed them into two Bs. Fantastic. So I've gone back to the Isle of Man. Six months later, mum and dad have said, no, we've changed our mind, you're coming back. And you're going back into Brighton High. 
and I've gone in to see the principal. I oh, know, Mum will tell you something in a minute. Um, and he said, right, maths one and two for you. And I've gone, oh. and by the time we had five subjects, luckily I could only do maths S, so one maths. But yes, I, I've, it haunts me. It backfired. Mum was just going to say why you brought me back, was it? With the Queen's Guard, was that the thing? Ah. Ah, right. Become a bandsman. Yep. In Northern Ireland or in Ireland. In the Queen's Guard, and then the yeah. Queen's Guard would have been posted to Ireland. Yes. Well, that would have been a short, possibly a very short career Absolutely. move. Yeah. So instead, back here, and a very sad one, I yeah. might say, the troubles yeah. are not over still. Um, so back you came, got involved in music at Brighton, went yep. off to music college, degree in performance, completed a graduate de diploma in education and then was inflicted upon the student population of Robe. At Robe, yes. Is so that you? That's me. Look at you. Position. Yes, so, What's so that, that what Robe. year is that? 1970 uh, by the hair? It looks like it, but it was actually 1984. Yep, 84. 84. I know. Gosh, still I had was, a bit of a mullet happening there. I was there. never one for fashion. Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. And is that the first class or the first that, that looks like that's teachers? That's staff. So that's at, so that's uh, at Hackham, Robe? That's at Hackham Westdale. Oh, no, we've moved on. So you yep. did a bit down in the southeast yep. teaching. Yep. Ended up then at Hackham West. And yes. after about four weeks, what happened? So I won the job of... Uh, I was a deputy in Millicent and then I won the job of deputy in Hackham West and a few weeks after I arrived, the principal was seconded for just a couple of weeks. She needed to go off and do a job for the department. And two and a half years later, she hadn't come back. So I was appointed principal after she left. So I was 26 at the time. Um, I was the youngest principal in the state. My ego took over. My head swelled up. Um, but I learned a really important life lesson during that time, that there's a reason why things should happen in a certain sequence and at a certain time. And I was just way too young. I had a fantastic experience there. The staff were wonderful. We dealt with a lot of issues. But I wasn't then, once you become an, an admin person, you're not part of the, the, the teaching staff group. So people stop talking when you come into the uh, staff room, just in case they say the wrong thing. And yet I was 20 years younger than all the other principals at the principals conference. So it was a challenge. So I'd have had that all the way through. But you know, wonderful years in the, in the schools. So that's Hackham West. That's Wollonga. Um, I'd been at uh, Robe, Millicent, Aldinga, Flaxmill, Victor Harbour, and Wollonga was the last one. So why did you leave teaching? So in uh, 2001, um, my wife died in childbirth. I think I've got a... So that's Tanya. A difficult time. And something that we, as a modern first world yep. country, tend to forget ever happens. Yep. That's right. So and it does still happen. It does. So I was at, uh, at Wollonga. Um, we lost Tanya in 2001. Charlie, our daughter, survived, which I'm pleased for most of the time. <laughs> you can take it out on him later, yeah, Charlie. Yeah, absolutely. All right, that's twice he's got you today. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, that's our wedding. That's us with Lewis, who's over here now. And uh, what happened as a single dad, um, a single parent at home with a two-year-old and a new baby, I took a bit of time off from work and then eventually got back into teaching at, uh, at Wollonga. But I found myself becoming less and less tolerant of a lot of the things that I'd probably managed in the past. So, you know, I'm generalising a bit, but the mum that comes in and wants to argue about why have we got Balfour's pies and not Philly's pies, <laughs> it really... Didn't, I used to sit and listen and you know, talk about it and after a while I found that my tolerance for that was, was not where it needed to be. And Wollonga was, was the best experience of all of them. And I thought, well, where else am I going to go? What will be different? And so I stayed there for a while. And then after a few years, I met Leanne. And Leanne was in a very similar position. She'd lost her husband to cancer in six weeks, so the father of Dale, Chelsea and Erin. And she found that uh, I was set up. She organised a lunch one day. 
She really just wanted to fight, meet somebody who was a similar age, who'd been through a similar experience, and we could share support and stories about death and dying and how you manage and all these sorts of things. And what happened was that things moved on really, really quickly. We went to Byron Bay on the 18th of April, 2005, and got married at 11 a.m. in the morning. With and the kids. With the kids. And, and look at it, it's gorgeous. So that's all the kids on the, the morning. Who's um, the one immediately behind you who's looking so fascinated? That's Erin. Erin always pays attention. Erin, paying yep. a lot of attention to yep. the wedding there. Chelsea's <laughs> doing something artistic in the left-hand yeah. side. Good. Dale, I'm not sure what he's doing there. Lewis is probably looking at his feet. Um, and Charlie's probably playing in the sand. <laughs> very, very beautiful wedding. And that's probably our favourite photo. Gorgeous. And then we had a, a little um, reception just with my brother and a few other people on the beach. And then we went on our honeymoon with all the kids. As a Brady Bunch. <laughs> we did. The Denver Bunch. Yep. And that's the wedding photo. Look at them all. Just gorgeous. So I'll just flick through these. So we've been married now for 16 years and, and because it wasn't a divorce situation, there were no exes involved, so nobody to have to liaise with or argue with. Um, we still had all the grandparents on both sides, all the in-laws and no outlaws. And we just had lots and lots of adventures. So... Children growing up, sort of first day of school was always a bit of a fun day. Parties, so that was Dale's pirate party. Um, lots of dress-ups, so that's me in a rabbit suit. Mad Hatter. Mad Hatter, that was Lee's 50th. Um, this layout of the photo we've done so many times. So that's an early one. That's a little bit later. <laughs> Later again, Chelsea's wedding in the back garden. Lee's got a moon boot on because she broke her foot going down Mount Lofty uh, track. And that's really the family now. What's really lovely sitting up here, and I'm going to explain it to you because you're not sitting up here, is that the table in front of us, which is the family table, it's like being at a slide night yeah. and watching the family's faces respond to their slides. It's just gorgeous. Everybody's yeah. smiling about yeah. and, you know, grinning and exchanging glances about different memories from what are a beautiful or is yeah. a beautiful set of slides. So then... All this joy and happiness yep. and children, five of them, Brady Bunch, you probably had a Tarago or something similar at some on stage. The, on, the, on the honeymoon we did, Yeah, yes. you would have. Because <laughs> um, anybody with that many children and the need yep. for that many car seats has to have a small bus. Uh, and then you had a midlife crisis. Yeah, had a midlife crisis um, after I'd left Wollonga. Um, decided to become an antique dealer. Because? It seemed like a nice thing to do and we liked watching Antiques Roadshow. What better reason could there be? Why not start a business? And so I started, I started studying with a, uh, the Regency Academy of Antiques in London um, and then understudied with most of the dealers in Adelaide, learnt enormous amount, an enormous amount about how it all works, how crooked it all is, how the price, prices are really inflated. But, uh, and that most antique dealers aren't actually dealers. They don't want to sell you anything. They're collectors. So they just fill their shops up and... Uh, but after a while, uh, we, we had a cafe that, that we were going to turn into an antique shop, but we realised that we couldn't make a living doing that and I wasn't going to sit around all day talking to old ladies about chintz and Carlton wear. And so I decided I needed to get a real job. So we looked around and there was a small business for sale, um, Enable Training and Recruitment, and we were down at Port Adelaide. So we bought the business and we were training people to work in the care industry, but at that stage it was only uh, disability support. From there, we grew, we added childcare, my background, we added uh, aged care, some business studies, and we moved into the city to 31 Franklin Street. One day, I got a mountain of phone bills delivered to me, and what's going on here? They were all for 31 Flinders Street, and the head office of the education department that I'd worked for for all those years <laughs> is at 31 Flinders Street. So I took great delight in walking down to 31 Flinders Street and said, I think these are yours. <laughs> <laughs> So that's our building in town. When I started the business, started the business, that's what I looked like. <laughs> Thirteen years later, a <laughs> little bit different. Uh, a couple of years ago, we celebrated 20, our 25th anniversary. These are photos of um, uh, trainers, admin staff, and graduates. We like nothing more than to see people come in who are 
predominantly from overseas, very uh, insecure, nervous, haven't studied maybe since primary school, but need to get a job. And by the time they leave us, their shoulders are back, their chest is out, they stand tall, and they all get jobs. So these are just a range of photos of the staff. That one's International Women's Day. We went to China for a few times. Um, that was a huge experience, but uh, just a wonderful time. So that's us at uh, some formal gathering. Um, there's Lee doing the same thing. Uh, we signed a contract with a firm in uh, Shenzhen. Now, this is all happening leading yep. up to over the years, the yep. 25 years you ran the business up until 2019. Yep. And as we all know, at the beginning of 2020, the world changed and particularly yep. the world of travel and the yep. world of uh, migration and the world of education and your private business is part of the state's um, billion dollar, multi-billion I think, mm. um, one of the biggest industries in the state is mm. education, mm. a concept I find really entrancing on another level as a former teacher myself, but the last 18 months must have been particularly challenging mm. for you. So I took all this, I put my hand up for this job, well, the President's role, in September 2019. At that point, blue skies, everything's wonderful. I've got two senior managers in the business who were running all the day-to-day -day operations, and I was in and out, and I, I could see that I was getting more and more time. We've got no grandchildren yet. Need to hurry Don't up. Don't do that. We've got no grandchildren not yet. Not allowed to do that to people. But That's I thought not I, fair. <laughs> I thought I had a window of opportunity to be able to put more time into Rotary. And, uh, and then COVID hit. We managed to get through the first year okay because we were really living off the students who had already emigrated to Australia. Um, we don't work with students who come over here on a student visa, study at the university and then go back. We mostly work with, with families who are emigrating to Australia to start a new life, as we did. Um, and everything started to go downhill late last year, but then in the beginning of this year, it really went downhill. So we're now at the position where we're not sure what the future holds, um, and it's a week-by-week it's a -week proposition. Um, we have got a couple of options that we're looking at with uh, potential partners, um, but the next month or so will be crunch time for us. We uh, have made some big decisions as a family. We, we're, our house is going on the market in a couple of weeks. Um, that's really more a downsizing exercise that we were always going to do, it's just come a bit earlier. It sort of forced the decision for us. Um, but over the last few months, we've had Dad going downhill rapidly, needing to go into care, um, business not going so well, not going well at all, house on the market, um, president's role started to, to loom, and then on Monday we had to have our dog put down as well. So it's just been a shit time lately. Um, but one of the things that has come out of this is that it's really Adri... I hope he's still awake because he was uh, up at 4.30 this morning. He'd been up all night watching soccer. Um, people, I had Adrian on the phone one day. I can't remember why it happened, but I just burst into tears. And he was the first person that rallied around. And then all of a sudden, so many of you rallied around. And, and that, you know, I thought about abdicating and I joked about it last week. But when I saw the support that was offered, I thought, no, I, I can, we can do this. It'll be... You know, this month will be challenging, but hopefully things will settle and, and we'll be right after, you know, the next few weeks. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to Adri for, for starting that. Indeed. It's been a, a life not without challenges, but a life with a great deal of success. Which do you learn most from? Or which have you learned most from, do you think? Um, Tanya dying. Was, was certainly the biggest one. Um, you know, if I dented my car before, that, before she died, if I dented my car, I'd be upset for a while. Now I don't really care. The, you know, the, the, the plastic stuff, the, the objects, they don't matter. It's, it's the relationships and the people. I worked out a long time ago that for me, life is about relationships. It's not about what you have or necessarily what you do, but it's about the people that you're with. Um, in terms of charity work, I got to my early... 40s and was looking for something different um, uh, and looked at Kiwanis and, and uh, Lions and CFS and all these things and it was Giuliano and Jeffrey um, 
uh, Reed, sorry, I just forgot his name. So Jeff Reed, who invited me along to a Rotary meeting. And, and that was it. I got involved here and now I just, just love it. So Tanya dying, you know, we don't sweat, we don't sweat the, the small stuff anymore. Um, all of our kids have been through the same experience. Um, in our house, upstairs, they have photos of whatever they want. So their dad, me, Tanya, whoever, all around. Downstairs, we've got our group photos. And, and it's about our life together. So, yeah, we, we, we look for opportunities to have fun and enjoy ourselves. And we really don't sweat the small stuff at all. It's an important lesson, isn't it? Especially in a privileged, largely white... Um, first world nation, I've when we're all running around worrying about which particular vaccine we might <sighs> deign to have. I rang a woman the other day, a couple of few weeks ago now, we only get paid when a student submits an assessment that is marked competent. So they might have to do it a few times, but it's competent, then we get paid. So I've rung this woman who's overdue. And we're chatting away, and she was so apologetic. Oh, I'm really sorry, I'll get it in by next week. And I said, that's OK, that's OK. She said, I'm just, I'm just dealing with some stuff in my life at the moment. Five of her loved ones have died in India. Five. And I just said, how could you even think of studying? Just forget it, you know? What else can we do to support you? It just brings it all into context that, you know, moving house and all that sort of stuff is no big deal. But five people, yeah. In your immediate family? Yep. And yet, we're worrying about whether we'll take vaccine A or vaccine B. Correct. So, I'm particularly cross. I hope... Is there anybody in here who's a conspiracist? <laughs> I don't think they'll... Anyone who <laughs> genuinely thinks that the vaccine is transmitting a chip into your body <laughs> and you're going to be controlled by the government? I'm not joking. There are people amongst us who believe this. And I think it's one of the greatest challenges that we face as a community is being too polite to people who are patently silly. There are stronger words I could use, but <laughs> if you're really worried about how you're being controlled by the government or the cabal of people who are meant to be controlling us, Throw away your mobile phone, people, because I tell you what, these things, you'll be tracked a lot more readily by this thing than you will be by, or the smaller versions or anything else, than by a vaccine in your arm. Please get vaccinated. Please. Choose which one you want. If that's your poison or pleasure, take advice from your doctor. But please. I was reminded of this and that sweating the small stuff stuff. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to override this just for a moment and say... <laughs> I grew up in a small country town, not on the Isle of Man, and I can remember we didn't have a car. We came from... I was fairly poor background, but my dad was the local carrier and had a truck. And one of the most interesting outings I remember as a little girl was when my two younger brothers and I got piled into the front of the truck, the five-ton truck that was our only vehicle, and driven around to Staffsmith's sh shop, which is where the caravan for the chest X-ray machines were. Because in country Australia, what would this be? This would be back in the 60s. And I'm sure many of you remember similar outings with your parents if you were in the country where you had to be dragged along because mum and dad had to go and have a compulsory chest X-ray to make sure that Australia rid, it, rid ourselves of tuberculosis. My father had infantile paralysis as a little boy and had one leg an inch shorter than the other. My mother lost her elder brother to polio. Do you think my parents sat around discussing the goods or the bads of their children having the polio vaccine. These were seen, and we no longer have polio. We no longer have smallpox in the world. We no longer have our children subjected to measles and going deaf from rubella in utero. And now we find ourselves beset in this privileged white world saying, oh, well, you know, there's a very tiny risk that something might happen. I don't think mm. I want the vaccine. Mm. Get over it. Mm. Sorry. Get over it, Australia. Well said. And get on with it. Yeah. For those of you with serious health concerns, sure. Get your... See, I told you he'd be up. He's got a hammer. He'll belt me in a minute. But this is a serious 
it's a serious issue for our community and that's why I'm on my little hobby horse about that because I'm just sick of people going, mm, uh, uh, with this much information, something they've picked up in some internet feed and going, oh, no, I don't want to put myself or my children or my mother or my father at risk. If we don't do our bit as a community, we put everyone at risk. And I'm sure Joy, mm. when she had that spirit of adventure, made sure that your kids got vaccinated and got looked after mm. properly so that the rest of the Isle of Man or Brighton or wherever it was you were living at the time mm. was safe. Mm. And that's, that's what fine. we've all got to do. Sorry, Paul, I don't no, mean to do that. We'll I don't know what came over me, but <laughs> the sort of hardship yeah. that you faced yep. in your life, losing your wife and Lee losing mm. her husband, the children losing a parent, mm. that's the stuff mm. that makes your metal. Mm. And that's, that's why you're still here as president, despite facing what I'd have to say is a bit of a cluster. We have another word that we add to that in the television <laughs> industry. I won't bore you with that one, but it, it's a bit of a cluster for you yeah. just at the moment. Yeah. And, sir, I applaud you for the resilience the determination and clearly the respect you have amongst your peers in this club who have rallied around you and said, no, Paul, we want you as our president and we will support you whatever's happening with your business, with your family, with your dog, with your house. Mm. And all credit to you and may you have a fantastic year as president of the Adelaide Rotary Club. Thank Congratulations. You, Thank you very much. So tonight when you watch Seven News, uh, you will know exactly what Jane thinks when she reports on the AstraZeneca <laughs> or the Pfizer vaccine. Um, look, I can't add more than that. We won't do questions today because the whole uh, talk has been about questions. But I just really want to thank uh, Paul, first up, for being so open and sharing uh, with us today of his life and his struggles. Uh, but Jane also, we want to thank you because like I said, Jane has a wonderful ability to draw out the conversation and haven't we been privileged today to sit here and listen to this wonderful conversation between two friends? He did make it easy. Yes. He had a great slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> so I think one day we need to bring Jane back and just have an afternoon with Jane. Uh, to hear uh, to hear what Jane has to say, but you know uh, it's been a wonderful afternoon. And Jane, I just want to thank you very much for again blessing us with your with your time. Um, but uh, we want to give you this um, as a uh, thank you. A donation will be made on your behalf to the Rotary Adelaide Community Service and Youth Project. So thank, thank you, you so much for being. <laughs> Okay, I just have a couple more things to do. One is to make an apology. Margaret O'Neill, I'm so sorry. I missed you out before. Margaret is a guest of Frank. Um, those of you that don't Mar know Margaret, well, everyone knows Margaret. She's sitting over there. Um, I'll do better next time. Okay, so uh, that's it for today. Next week we are meeting here again in the McLaughlin Room. Um, the speaker is Professor Vincent Bologna. I think it's Bologna. Um, Director of Adelaide... Glycobics of the University of Adelaide. Thank you to all our guests. Um, we're sorry that there was a bit of a kerfuffle at the beginning of the, the meeting. Um, those, of you, those of you that were in here probably wouldn't have seen it, but it was certainly happening out at the front desk. Um, and it was quite sad that we had to turn the road actors away today and some other of our members. So please, if we could reinforce to do the bookings online, um, that will help enormously. Thank you, everybody, for listening to me today. Um, most of you are still awake. Adriana's still awake, which is great. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>